Hello students, this is Mr. Allen. Today we are going to look at chapter six. So we're starting off this semester in chapter six and we're gonna look at uh, polygons and parallelograms. Our objective today is to find the sum of measures of polygons, both interior and exterior angles. And in section two, we're gonna use properties of parallelograms to determine measures. So our first theorem, theorem 6.1, says that the sum of the interior angles of an n-gon is n minus two times 180. So what that's telling us, for example, is we already know that the sum of the angles of a triangle is 180 degrees. We already know that. So what this is saying is if we took a triangle, for example, and I wanted to know what the measure of angle X, Y, and Z is. Well, there are three sides to a triangle. So we would say that that's equal to N. So N is equal to three. So we would plug that into our formula and we would say that three minus two times 180, which is equal to one times 180, which is equal to 180 degrees. Now I'm just showing you that to verify that this is the theorem or the formula of the theorem and that it works. And we can see that uh, in here is just the number of sides. So it says, what is the sum of the interior angles of a, of a heptagon? Now I actually have two heptagons here and a heptagon is just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sides. Notice that this heptagon on the left is a regular heptagon. Regular just means that all the sides are equal. This one here is not regular, okay? This heptagon has sides of different length. It doesn't matter, the theorem applies to both. So heptagon, means that n is going to be seven. So now we're gonna use our formula, which is n minus two times 180, which is gonna be seven minus two times 180. So that's gonna be equal to five times 180. And so we're just gonna figure out what five times 180 is. And I would recommend, don't try to do these in your head, just go ahead and use your calculator to make sure you get it right. My calculator says that this is 900. I'm gonna call it 900 degrees. So I'm telling you, regardless of what kind of heptagon we're talking about, if you were to add this angle to this angle, to this angle, to this, if you added all these angles up, the sum of their measures is 900 degrees. Let's look at another example. So here we have a pentagon and they're asking us to find the measure of angle Y. And this is Pentagon today, T-O-D-A-Y. So the first thing that I would do here is know that N is equal to five because Pentagon, Penta means five. So now I'm gonna use my formula, five minus two times 180. Well, that's gonna be three times 180. And again, I'm gonna use my calculator here to make sure I don't make any careless mistakes and I get 540. So I know that the sum of the angles is equal to 540. In other words, now I'm going to continue this problem. I know that, and this is 90, right? I know that 90 plus 110 plus 120 plus 150 plus the measure of angle Y, oops, Y not five, angle Y, all of that has to equal 540. Now again, I'm gonna use my calculator to help me out here and I'm gonna add that 90 plus 110 plus 120 plus 150. So that's gonna tell me that 540 is equal to the measure of angle Y plus when I added all those other angles together, I got 470. Now I'm just gonna subtract that from 540. So I get that the measure of angle Y is equal to 70 degrees. 
measure of angle Y, this guy right there is 70 degrees. So here's an example of how I use the, let's go back to the theorem, polygon angle sum theorem to figure out that all the angles have to add up to 540. And then I was able to find the missing measure for angle Y. Okay, now we're gonna move on to section 6.2. Section 6.2 says the sum of the measures of the exterior angles of a polygon, one at each vertex, is 360. Now, this is, this is kind of interesting. So it turns out, no matter how many sides the polygon has, if you measure each angle of the, these, by the way, these are the exterior angles here. These are these outside, let me do that in red. These outside angles, oops. These, if you add all these up, in this case, there's five of them because this is a pentagon, they have to add up to 360. So the measure of angle one, plus the measure of angle two, plus the measure of angle three, plus the measure of angle four, plus the measure of angle five, would equal 360. And this is for any polygon. In fact, if I wanted to, I could go back here. And if I wanted to, I could tell you that this angle, plus 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 this angle. There's seven of them. If you add up all those angles, it's 360. So question, uh, actually I should have labeled that as example three, guys. I'm sorry, this should be example three, but anyway, we'll call it example two B, okay? It says, what is the measure of angle one in this regular octagon at the right? So first of all, notice it says octagon, so that means that N is eight. And it says regular, that means that all sides are congruent. And all the angles are going to be congruent as well. So here's what we're going to do. The first thing that we know is that the sum of all exterior angles is equal to 360. And how many of those angles do we have? Well, we have eight of them. So I'm just gonna say that eight X equals 360. And now I'm just gonna divide. And again, I'm gonna use my calculator so as I don't make any careless mistakes. And it turns out that X is 45. Therefore, the measure of angle one is 45 degrees. What is the measure of angle one? The measure of angle one is 45 degrees. In fact, guess what the measure of angle two is? It is also 45 degrees. And the measure of angle three is also 45 degrees. Now I used the polygon exterior angle sum theorem to get that answer. Theorem 6.3. If a quadrilateral is a parallelogram. Now let me just make sure that I, I explain this. A parallelogram is a quadrilateral to draw a picture of it. It's a quadrilateral, so that means it has four sides. That's what quadrilateral means. Parallelogram means that opposite sides are parallel. That's why we call it a parallelogram. So the top and the bottom are parallel and the left and the right are parallel. So it says if a quadrilateral is a, par a parallelogram, then the opposite sides are congruent. So this, remember, this is that P arrow Q we've been using all year, year. If this, then that. So the hypothesis is, is if it's a parallelogram, the conclusion is, is that the opposite sides are congruent. In other words, if I told you that this side over here was five, and I asked what this side length would have to be, it also has to be five. If I told you the bottom side here was eight, what would the top have to be? It would have to be eight. So that's what theorem 6.3 says. 6.4 is also about parallelograms. If a quadrilateral is a parallelogram, then its consecutive angles are supplementary. Now, don't forget that supplementary means they add up to 180. Consecutive angles would be something like this. So angle one, angle A right here and angle D. Those two angles, angle A and angle D, those are consecutive angles. They have to add up to 180. That's what supplementary means. Angle B and angle C. So that means, let me erase those guys. Angle B and angle C are consecutive angles. They have to add up to 180. Angle C and D have to equal 180. 
consecutive angles. That means one after the other, okay? So let's look at this example. And the first thing I'd like you to do is I'd like you to notice that over here on the right-hand side, we've got a lamp. I don't know if you guys have ever seen a lamp like that. That's kind of adjustable. You can adjust kind of where the light points. And what I'd like you to notice about this lamp is look at, uh, sorry, look at the shape that's in here. That shape, there's a quadrilateral. In fact, not only is it a quadrilateral, look at that special symbol there. That symbol means it's a parallelogram. And this is actually true. If you have one of these devices, that is actually a parallelogram shape. So if you see parallelogram PQRS, that's what we want to focus on. Now the question is, is what is the measure of angle P? Now we know we're given that the measure of angle S is 64 degrees. We want to know what's the measure of angle P. That's this angle up here. Well, we're going to use our previous theorem, theorem 6.4, to figure that out. And this theorem says that if a quadrilateral is a parallelogram, then its consecutive angles are supplementary. So I know that the measure of angle S plus the measure of angle P has to equal 180. This is by theorem, let me make sure I get this right, theorem 6.4, the theorem we just talked about. Now we can go and find our answer. What was the measure of angle S? Well, it was 64. Measure of angle P, I don't know what it is. It equals 180. So now as I gotta do is 180, and I need to subtract 64 from that, and that gives me 116. The measure of angle P is 116 degrees. That is the answer to this question. All right, theorem 6.5, which is again on parallelograms because six, section 6.2 is all on parallelograms. And this one says, if a quadrilateral is a parallelogram, then its opposite angles are congruent. So if we have a parallelogram, remember that's what the symbol means, then the opposite angles are congruent. In other words, angle A and angle C are gonna be congruent, which means they have the same measure. And similarly, angle B and angle D are going to be congruent. Theorem 6.6, .6. if a quadrilateral is a parallelogram, then the diagonals bisect each other. So if ABCD is a parallelogram, and this is a diagonal, and this is a diagonal, then they bisect each other. In other words, segment AE is going to be congruent to segment CE. Similarly, segment BE is going to be congruent to segment DE. So example four here. Solve a system of linear equations to find X and Y in the parallelogram KLMN. What are KM and LM? So this one's a little bit more involved than the previous examples. So the first thing that we know is that since KLMN is a parallelogram, then the diagonals bisect each other. That's by our previous theorem on this previous slide, theorem 6.6. Write that down. So if they bisect each other, that means it cuts them into equal parts. In other words, L P is equal to P N. That's what congruent means. We also know that K P has to be equal to P M. Now we're going to go ahead and start substituting some stuff in. I'm going to actually erase this guy here. I'm going to do it in purple over here. So I'm going to write K, oops, K P is equal to P M. And what is KP? Well, KP is Y plus 10. PM is 2X minus 8. Those have to be equal. And then over here back on the last part, we know that X has to be equal to Y plus 2. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a technique 
uh, that you probably, hopefully you remember this from algebra one called the substitution technique to solve this system. So what I'm literally gonna do is I'm gonna take this X or X is equal to Y plus two. So I'm just gonna plug Y plus two in for X. In other words, Y plus 10 is gonna be equal to two times Y plus two. So instead of X here, I put Y plus two minus eight. And I'm going to solve that equation. So I'm going to actually let you guys solve that equation. And I'm going to solve it too, but I'm going to just do it kind of on my own here. So I would like you to check that my answer is correct because I might make a mistake. I will try not to, but I'm going to leave that for you. So looking things out here. So I get y is equal to 14. Now I would encourage you to check to make sure I got that right, but I'm pretty confident that y is equal to 14. So, and I can check that right now. Okay. Okay, now how do we find X? Well, since I know what Y is, I can now use this equation to figure out what X is. So I can plug 14 in there. So it looks like X is going to be 14 plus two, which is gonna be 16. So now I have what Y is, I now have what X is. Now the last thing it asked me to do is find KM. So KM is this entire length right here. So how are we gonna do that? Uh, let's do what's a color I haven't used. Let's use blue. So K M is equal to Y plus 10 plus two X minus eight. So now I got to substitute X and Y into that. So Y we said here is 14 and X is 16 minus eight, and I'm gonna use my calculator again here just to make sure that I don't make any careless mistakes. I'm literally just going to type this in exactly like I have it. And I get that KM is equal to 48. 48. And then the last thing we need to do here is find LN. Let's do that in black. That's this distance here. That's gonna be a little bit easier here. So LN is equal to X plus Y plus two. So that's going to be, remember X is 16. So that's 16 plus Y, which is 14 plus two. I think I can do that one in my head. Uh, I think that's gonna be 32. That's what LM is, LN. Pretty involved example. I like this one, this is a good one. Not, not very, I, I, I don't know that you could do this one in your head. All right, last theorem. Theorem 6.7 says, if three or more parallel lines cut off congruent segments on a transversal, then they cut off congruent segments over every transversal. So here's what this is saying. So we've got this line here, uh, let's call it line, I'll put it in red. This is line AE, and then I'll do another line over here. Let's do it in blue this line over here, this is line BF. Now notice that in the picture, they tell us that AC is equal to EC. So what this theorem is saying is the following. If AC is equal to EC, then these two segments over here also have to be congruent. So if this, the segments on the left are congruent, then the segments on the right are, have to be congruent, assuming that those uh, lines are parallel. So you can see those arrows. So our final example here, here we are given that we have a bunch of parallel lines. I'm not going to read all those to you. And they tell us that, and I'll go ahead and write this on, that AB is two, that's two. They tell us that BC is two, and they tell us that CD is two. They tell us that EF, that's this guy right here, is 2.25. And the question is, what is EH? Now I'm going to put, I'm going to highlight that segment. That's this whole segment right here, all the way from E to H. 
So how are we going to find that answer? Well, we're going to use this last theorem. Since these two lines are cut by a bunch of parallel lines and all of these segments at the top are, are congruent, all of these segments at the bottom have to be congruent. So that means that EF is 2.25. It also means that FG is 2.25. And it also means that GH is 2.25. In fact, let me go ahead and write that. So this is congruent to this, congruent to this, which means that this piece has to be congruent to this piece, which has to be congruent to this piece. So EH is going to be equal to EF plus FG's length plus GH. So EH is equal to 2.25 plus 2.25 plus 2.25. So our final answer here is going to be 6.75. That's what EH's length will be. Question for you to wrap this up. Could we have done that in a simpler way? Is there an easier way we could have done that problem? All right, that's the end, guys. Thanks for your attention.